it. So here we are. Welcome everybody to another week of uh, Health uh, Holistic Veterinarians, Christina Chambro, and I'm Jeff Feynman. And this week we're going to be discussing a topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts, which is skin problems in dogs and cats. Where do they come from? How do you prevent them? How do you treat them? And how do ears factor into the decision? into the treatment decision and are they part of the skin or are they separate? So before we begin, I just uh, wanted to ask Christina, anything great this week? Anything you want to mention? Mm, not particular, not that I can think of at the moment. I so live in the moment. The last week is like gone and bye-bye by now. <laughs> I do want to point out that um, because it'll disappear in a bit, I did put a link um, in the live chat to a, a small article I have on skin and ears, which will be really summarizing everything that we're talking about today. And um, also, um, I recommend, you know, when we're talking about skin, Wendy Jensen's book, Healing from the Inside Out is exactly what we're going to be talking about today because we're going to be talking about rather than trying to treat skin from the outside although we can soothe it that way we want to treat we want to have the skin get better by treating the animal from the inside so and, onward jeff and that that really is the the crux of everything that we do is that we treat based on the, the totality and not the reductionistic, you know, single, single symptoms. So why don't we, why don't we start a little bit with what, what you just said, you know, as far as what is the genesis of most skin diseases, skin problems that we see in dogs and cats, and we're not going to talk initially about diet or genetics, but why at about six or eight weeks of age are dogs and cats being set up for skin problems later in life? You I, tell me. Yeah. I don't know. What are you thinking oh. of? <laughs> I, I think that the, the initial series of vaccinations oh, are, being okay. given, are being given way too early. And that that is the beginning of the immune dysfunction that leads to a hypersensitivity that is basically manifest in skin allergies. Well, I'm sure that, you know, that certainly contributes. For me, I really do feel it's more diet related and uh, toxin related. And the reason I say that is I would say that I cure a lot of skin cases without necessarily using vaccinosis remedies, whereas other ailments, I don't see that as much. I'm not saying at all, and it certainly does weaken, you know, any vaccines do, certainly when they're given way too young. Yeah, I keep forgetting that people vaccinate at six weeks, the veterinarians recommend that. It, it, I, I literally forget that they do that. That's so when you said six to eight, that didn't even cross my mind. You know, wait 12, 14, <laughs> or do what Rosemary Manziano does and just have them exposed. Natural exposure. Yeah, natural, natural exposure, exposure is the way to go. And so the the reason that I think and from what I've read that the vaccines are such a huge factor in the skin. It's because the skin disease and actually many diseases that we see are actually overreactions, overreactivity of the immune system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they are hypersensitivities, whether it's a hypersensitivity or an overreaction to a food, to an environmental toxin, a pollen, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's, we focus a lot on eliminating the triggers, whereas I think we need to really address mainly the underlying problem. And the underlying problem is the hypersensitivity of the immune system. And why does the immune system get hypersensitive? 
because it's been taught from a very early age that you need to overreact. You need to you know, react to things that may or may not be real in the environment. And of course, I'm talking about vaccinations because here the immune system is being exposed to hundreds of toxins, let alone the parvo and distemper that are in there as part of the vaccine. You know, 99.9% of the vaccines are the adjuvant. The other part of the vaccine that are designed to overstimulate the immune system, that is their function. And, you know, we focused for years on mercury, now they're finding that aluminum in vaccine, which is also ubiquitous, mm -hmm. is a huge, huge problem. So, yeah, I, I don't see many skin diseases in my truly naturally reared patients. And by truly, I mean no puppy vaccines. But you're not seeing any problems in those dogs. I don't know if I would say that because there are still, like you said, there's still um, environmental toxins and things that are going to, you know, impact the body in a very, you know, very potentially harmful way. So we're getting off track. Where, 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 since you feel that diet is such a big trigger early on, where would you start feeding wise with the six? Eight? Well, when I say diet, I don't mean any specific foods. I simply mean the um, com people who are feeding commercial diets. Um, and commercial diets are full of junk and they're full of toxins and the meat sources have been raised with stress, killed with stress and are um, um, done with G the grains that the meat eaters or that, that the uh, cows and chickens are being fed are glyphosate, GMO and toxins. So we have biofilms. So we have a, a lot of processes that are going on in the body that are quite toxic and the skin in a fairly healthy animal, the skin is the place where it's gonna to try to resolve these. And even with the adjuvants from the vaccines, you know, I think the skin is one of not just the hypersensitivity, but actually trying to get it out of the body. So, you know, if, you know, when people get really drunk and then the next day they don't feel very good, if they go out and exercise and sweat a whole lot, they get rid of, it seems like they get rid of some of the toxins that are in their body. So, um, so I've seen a, a number of, you know, I just, I see a lot of animals that once they switch to a better diet, much better diet, that their skin problems just resolve. And I also have animals who, um, I feel that I should be able to get an animal healthy enough to eat food that's not that good part of the time. But um, I do see animals where people switch back to commercial food from a fresh food diet and skin problems appear. It's like sort of the first thing that, that shows up. Or, um, you know, people who move and they're in a new environment or it's um, they've got toxins in the house, like new furniture, new rugs, new paint things like that. And then I'll see dogs develop skin problems for a while. Um, and again, if they're really healthy, they shouldn't. They, they should be able to go through that, but they don't. The key thing that I think is important, especially when we're talking about diet, is this whole word allergy. A lot of people come to me with skin problems or digestive tract problems saying, can you cure my dog's allergy? Or I've been limited the foods from this to this to this. And um, allergies are not the cause. It's the underlying energy field imbalance that in trying to heal itself is what's producing the symptoms. So when it's off balance, it says, whoa, I need to get back in balance. So if it's healthy enough to push it to the outside, to the skin, then we're happy. I remember, um, one of our colleagues, Lori Tapp, had a dog 
that came to her with really bad skin problems and she adopted it. And she was having at one point in the years of treatment of this dog, she had to actually walk the dog at night because the skin was so bad that the, her neighbors were accusing her, a veterinarian, of mistreating the dog. So she would walk the dog at night, but she knew if she quickly stopped the skin, if she did anything suppressively, any drugs to make this dog look better, that the dog would become very, very ill. And over year, over the years, she was finally able to get this dog skin better. And once so again, that's the dog it. during the day. Right, <laughs> so she could walk him at day, daytime. <laughs> But you did give the very first and probably the most important action point when it comes to treating skin allergies and ear infections, neither of which are, are really you know, the problem in and of itself. The problem is usually, as you said, underlying. And the first action point that hopefully everyone here is already doing is to be feeding a fresh food diet. So no or minimal commercial food. Um, and if you have to do commercial, at least do you know, non-kibble um, and even non-canned food, you know, freeze-dried meat food or air-dried food or dehydrated food. There are so many of those on the market right now. And it is a direct reflection on the level of health of the health and healthfulness of the individual, how much of an inadequate diet and how much variety they're able to tolerate. Because as Christina just said, there are some dogs where all our dogs and cats, where all their problems clear up when they go onto a fresh food or better yet, raw food diet. But then they come right back as soon as they eat one biscuit or one bowl of dry food. And that, that in the end. Exactly. And, and the problem with that, because many people say, oh, I'll just avoid feeding that food and I'll be fine. But the problem with doing that is that is what's called palliation. That is covering up the underlying problem by not switching the diet, by only sticking to one regiment diet. And it's very, very, very important that we not palliate in that way, because if we do, the underlying process is going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger until finally, you know, something much more, much more serious, much more dangerous happens. And we see that Ever. Well, or you run out of protein sources. You've done the kangaroo and you've done the owl meat and you've done the, and they haven't Wait, made a new meat owl for you. Meat? No, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Well, that just flew into my, my head. <laughs> owl stopped uh, visiting a couple days ago. Maybe uh, that's from, uh, if Amy is here, Amy, you didn't hear that. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> This is bad for kangaroos and right, koalas. Kangaroo and what was the, uh, the, uh, the uh, zebras? Yeah, there are all kinds of novel diets. And of course, now the big um, chip been for a while are these hydrolyzed. You know, it's like the worst thing about commercial food is how processed it is. But now they have diets where they process the processed food. I tell there's virtually no real anything in there, you know, like the ZD special skin diet, so you don't react to it. They are the lowest. But again, different different animals are different. So, you know, good to feed a good diet, but a lot of dogs, even on a fresh food diet, have skin problems. So dogs and cats. So then where do we go, Dr. J? Well, I think there's there's only one curative place to go in those animals. And actually, I love, before I do anything else, I love to get all of my patients that have skin problems on a fresh food diet because many of them will resolve. But as you just said, Christina, many of them won't resolve. And the ones that don't resolve that are eating raw 
and our fresh food need to be treated homeopathically. And homeopathic treatment of the totality of the individual, the total expression of all the symptoms, that will actually equalize the hypersensitivity of the immune system that will lower the immune, the allergy threshold, because we all have an allergy threshold. Once you go over the allergy threshold, that's when problems begin. Homeopathic treatment lowers it to a more normal place, such that there are fewer triggers, fewer things. And I'm sorry, it doesn't lower it. It raises, thank you, it raises the allergy threshold such that there are fewer things that trigger the allergies. Wow, that was a horrible mistake. Take, ignore, ignore that. <laughs> and for me, it's more there's an energy field and different animals are sensitive to different things. And it, so it's not just raising a threshold, which is more physiological. It, for me, it's that energy field is getting, instead of being out of balance and having sensi a deep sensitivity to whatever foods or toxins are there, it eliminates that sensitivity and we now have a nice, flexible energy field that is unlikely to develop any allergy symptoms to anything. They're not sensitive to as many things. But then we have those that, you know, seem to be sensitive to just everything and don't give us a whole lot of symptoms because a lot of animals who come to us, especially for ear problems, even more so than skin problems in general, I think, because people will tolerate, or the animal seems to tolerate a long-term chronic ear problem better than a skin problem, which is so obviously all over the body. So I would, um, I see these coming in that have been treated with drugs to stop the symptoms so much that there are very few symptoms left to prescribe on homeopathically. And so it's one of the things we have to do is to warn people that when we're starting with a skin problem, if as we take the case, there's not a lot of symptoms, it may take longer to heal this animal because we have to so to go back in time to when the skin problem started. <clears throat> and um, because every time you do something suppressive, whether it's the wrong homeopathic remedy or giving prednisone, like this Weimaraner with um, feet allergies is getting, every time that you do something suppressive, it weakens this energy field and it deepens their sensitivity to allergens. So it makes the whole process much worse. Unfortunately, it's really hard. I mean, like I said, Dr. Tapp had to walk her dog at night or she was being accused of, of really mistreating her dog. So it is difficult to change paradigms. And so all we can do is to open the door to our friends and offer them deep cures and encourage them to be patient. And sometimes, even if they're working with a good homeopathic veterinarian, people don't understand as well um, the process. And some homeopathic veterinarians are very good prescribers, but not very good at teaching the underlying process. Um, they so therefore it, you know, you might need to walk your friend through Dr. Jensen's book. You know, maybe say, hey, did you read this paragraph? Or talk to her like that. Or if she lives in Maine or Maryland um, in September, on September 24th and 25th in Maine and in Maryland. Um, It'll be on um, October 1st and 2nd with the Friday night before. Um, I'll be teaching classes. It's an introduction to homeopathy, but it really is exactly what we do here. So we're talking about how to have healthy animals through the paradigm principles and philosophy 
of homeopathy. And so um, you might, maybe she'd be interested in taking a class. So people learn in different ways. And so sometimes you need a different way to learn. So you can offer that to her as well. I put the link to my website and the link to the co both courses are on my homepage. So that may help. And I think Debbie brought up and you discussed a little bit, the greatest obstacle to treatment, successful treatment of skin and ear disease is the ability of the guardian to tolerate the patience of working through the symptoms um, and realizing that unlike prednisone, they're not going to be gone in two days. And that, yeah, they might get woken up at three in the morning you know, for a couple of weeks, but it will gradually be improving. And that the more they stimulate the body with homeopathy or other things and then end up going back to prednisone, so the worst it's going to end up being in the long run. Now, the challenge with, with that is there are some animals that are so effectively suppressed with the steroids that they get their steroid shot, the skin condition clears up, and they seem to be fine for years until they come down with liver or cancer or something else. And it's a stretch for people who haven't seen this over and over again to realize that the cause was maybe the panelog they used as a puppy, that the cause of the later disease was the psychosporin they used in the eyes for dry eye, that something that was done when they were very young actually weakened this vital force so much it couldn't respond anymore, it couldn't make symptoms. And so it sort of simmered until it finally got healthy enough not to put it all the way out on the skin but to get it to make the liver sick to try to rebalance itself or to make cancer to rebalance itself. So um, it, it, it is, you know, when they're around people who say they're at the dog park and the dog park people say, oh yeah, I got a shot of steroids and my dog's been fine. What's fine? They're not looking at the early warning signs. So the dog may be inherently okay, the skin problem's gone, but it has goop in the corner of the eyes. It has a doggy odor and needs a bath every couple of weeks. They think that's normal. And oh, and by healthy. the way, you suddenly become afraid of thunder. You suddenly hiding in the closet uh, whenever people come over. Yeah. But that's not related to the fact that they just got a steroid shot. Yeah. So it is a matter of Something that's very important for anyone listening to this is whenever you've had a success, you need to share it. Put it out there, write up a little paragraph about it, write up, you know, whatever seems appropriate for you. And, and you can put it at the um, Holistic Veterinary Foundation, ahvmf.org. You can post it on Facebook. You can figure out ways to get the word out. We need to let people know that there are solutions for problems um, for our animals. And that'll help the people facing euthanasia because the vet said, I don't know what else to do. I'm done. Nothing more to offer. Or the people at the very beginning that are having skin problems in these young dogs may see, oh, oh, you mean if I stop the skin too quickly, then my dog might get sick later on. And so spread the word. That's so important. That's what Jeff, Jeff started this to hopefully spread and, the word. Right, yeah. And I think intuitively that makes sense to a lot of people that there's an underlying process and that if you stop the external manifestation too quickly, you're not actually getting at the underlying process. But part of the problem is I think when it comes to skin and ears and allergies in general, and I'm going to be quotes every time, um, is that the dermatologists are going to say that they're incurable, that that's the way it is forever, and you know, and he's probably going to be on drugs off and off for the rest of his life because that's all they know, which is fine. But that's not the way it is. 
I mean, Christina and I are here to tell you that's not the way it is, nor is that the way it needs to be. Um, and also, you need to realize, and I've mentioned it before in passing today, that um, homeopathy can suppress. If we give the wrong remedy, we can quickly get rid of the skin and have other problems, deeper problems appear. And your mentioning behavior made me think of one. Um, I had a dog that had been, you know, scratching and having skin issues, but not treated with very many drugs over the last two years. So a fairly long period of time. So think for a moment, should this get better really fast or should it take a few months to, to finally resolve? It's been going on for two years. So I prescribed a homeopathic remedy and two weeks later had a follow-up call and I knew I was in trouble when the woman's first words to me were, Dr. Chambro, you're a miracle worker. And I went, oh no, to myself. And I went, okay, well, tell me what's been happening. She said, 10 minutes after I gave the remedy, the itching stopped and the dog hasn't scratched since. So that's a sign of either suppression or maybe palliation, but usually one dose like that, it would be suppression. And I, it took me 20 minutes to come up with any problems. She kept saying, no, he's fine. Food's fine. Appetite's fine. Stool's fine. No goop in the corner of the eyes. Doggy odor is gone. It's wonderful. And finally she went, oh, I forgot. After a week, she started biting the children. Oh. Not good. What? Could it be good? So Jeff, how could it be a good prescription and having this dog bite um, the children? If that is the way the dog is naturally if that's if the dog if that is the dog's true expression of disease the dog used to be very quiet and mellow and now it's biting the kids you know it's possible that that is the way you know the true nature of the dog you need to use that as your next symptom through which you're able to work through the problems um but i agree and you know that's what I did. I prescribed for anger and irritability and the skin. And then we slowly, the skin got worse again and then got better. But it also could be a good sign of health if they start biting the children. If this was a dog who was ill enough with the skin disease that it wasn't standing up for itself with little children torturing it. So I had to ask that question, how were the children with the dog and what was that like? And of course, you know, it was an unlikely possibility, but I did, did yeah. need to check that out. Um, so then we ended up hearing that homeopathic remedies can suppress yeah. if they're the wrong ones, but it doesn't matter because then we can fix. When the new symptoms appear, regardless of how bad they are, we use the new symptoms to prescribe. And that's the joy of homeopathy is we're treating this energy field. And as it moves, we move. As it changes, we find a remedy that matches. So we eventually figure out how to get it back to balance again, as long as you have the patience to hang in there. And before I lose it in the chat here, I'll, I'll probably forget about it. One other tip, Debbie, if your friend um, you know, my experience has been that you know, one of the things that that is that can cause impatience in a lot of people, or that can help impatience in a lot of people, is diagnostics. And I know, Christina, you're going to disagree with me, but my first question is: Did they do a skin scrape on the feet? Did they see a dermatologist? Is there a name for this problem? or is it just a nondescript allergy? And the reason I say that is because I'm amazed every day almost by people who are so happy that they went to you know the specialist and the specialist gave them the name of, a, you know, of some syndrome, some description basically of what's going on, but it sounds fancy and it made the the, um, the guardians much um, feel better and much more willing to work through the problem. And I think that's, that's 
really what what we have to focus on is and that's you know one of the reasons why i think a lot of people have difficulty with homeopathy and actually any natural really truly natural and holistic uh, modality is that you need to have that patience and patience is not the same as neglect I mean, which I think is what what the Lori Tap story, you know, really accentuates. You know, really. it's careful yeah. observation, careful educated observation. Sure. My problem with sending them to specialists is that they're just so expensive, and um, they end up on drugs. So. Um, I try to educate a person well enough to hang in there, but it's a good point as a prescriber. Um, and even for those of you recommending homeopathy to your friends is if they seem not sure about this, have them get the diagnostics, but don't start treatment yet. And then maybe they'll feel more comfortable about doing, you know, working with the natural approach. Um, but you can also say, you know, the homeopath doesn't need that diagnosis to be able to prescribe. So if they're on the fence about money or, you know, they have some money issues, you can say, you know, you don't really need to spend a thousand dollars to go to the dermatologist. Instead, you could just start working with the homeopath. And sometimes, of course, a skin scraping or something like that is needed. But even there, mm -hmm. um, it's really that's not what we're basing our prescribing on, whether it's Demodex or Sarcoptic or a particular bacteria. And again, when you say needed, do you mean needed for a homeopathic diagnosis? Do you mean to find the remedy? No, yeah. No, it's rarely needed. I think it may be needed by the guardian, but you know, we, and I, I like diagnostics a lot because they help guide my Posology, my case management, and they do that a lot more than they they do help, you know, with the decision of the of the homeopathic medicine that we give. But yeah, if there's if there's a disease that we pick up on diagnostics, um, then we can use that as a marker or as an internal symptom to basically decide how we need to be dosing. Does it need to be every day? Does it need to be a lower potency? Do we need to do this, do that? That's just, that's more the, I guess, the the art of homeopathy. And, you know, we, everyone, everyone practices a little differently. So your friend went to a dermatologist and tried immunotherapy, which basically, Debbie, you know, we, are like giving vaccinations a couple of times a week for months and months. Increases that months hypersensitivity. And, and what they do and the reason it's successful is eventually the immune system gives up. And that... For a while. It quits for a while and then eventually produces some other illness. In some animals, not everybody. And I do want to go back to what you just said about diagnostics and expense. Um, and I've got two words for you there. And I try to, try to um, mention this to all of my new clients. And those two words are head insurance. Uh huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there it's. You know, there are some really good companies that um, do cover all the holistic approaches, including homeopathy. I was on with somebody, a client bond, who does weekly appointments for, for four or five pets. They have reimbursed her $43,000 in the past five years. Wow. That's awesome. awesome. That was Which company client. is that one? Pet plan. Pet plan. And my. Okay. I don't have a candy with me, but I do have a list of ones I researched that said they pet covered how plan does. Um, Embrace does. Um, healthy paws. Somebody said they do, but I. 
I'm not familiar with healthy paws. Uh, nationwide VPI. I think that more and more of them are covering homeopathy. And you can get a policy that is affordable. But a lot of these policies, I mean, you could spend $100 a month or more at Embrace. But at the end of the year, they're going to give you back $650 towards routine you know, foods and training and so, plus the fact that if you have that $10,000, $5,000 bill, they're going to cover 80 or 90% of it. Right. And now, right. Yeah, I think something I certainly, because I was doing this for so long before there was any insurance, I've been very slow to pick it up. And as my practice, I was waning, you know, cutting back on the practice, but I'm just really starting to you know, educate people about this in my classes, that you need to have pet insurance that covers holistic. Judy. So what else about skin problems? Okay, you're treating them homeopathically, but they're waking their owner up all night long, scratching. What can you do to help? What can you do to soothe the skin? And what about the ears? Oh, my God, they smell so bad. They've got yellow goo coming out. What are we going to do, Dr. Jeff? Um, Does my dog have to suffer? Third, yeah, suffering is, is, is a big part of the problem is people feel that they are suffering, that quality of life is, is uh, a big issue. Um, yeah, in those situations, if the homeopathic medicine is included, clear to me um, from the get-go, I'll usually go ahead and do gentle things that work with the body that can help, you know, help with mm -hmm. the symptoms. So if they have the smelly ears, you know, often just cleaning out or wiping out the ears with green tea or soothing them with sweet onion oil, this can help a lot. But there are some ear problems that are so sensitive that you can't even get near the ears. And that that is a problem for a lot of a lot of dogs and cats. Uh, they now have those new um ever hear of ear treatment. That's a once a week. It's a what? Cameo. It's a, an herbal it goes in the ear, but just once. And it can really take you off. But yeah, the, uh, the way you, you just described the scenario you, you described is one where you know, I think the dental palliation works body, along with the treatment, the same going to make it. Some... You're getting a little off Jeff and your picture is sort of blank I don't know how other people are yeah. um, there well now it's you're moving slowly yeah, your, your picture is, is gone all together so oh, one okay. of us so it's a blabby one, yeah it could be a blab or it could be a, a bandwidth for one of us I'm just looking yeah, yeah. yeah. so type in what what you were talking about to put in the ear. Okay, you are frozen. So, Amy, and now I, yeah. what what was the thing you were talking about to put in the uh, ear? The, here, well, let me uh, just write it down. Sorry. Yeah, type yeah. it in. It's called the cameo. So there it is. Yep. Okay. Never heard of it. There are those actually. Okay, see, and now, now I can hear and see you just fine. Yep, yep. Now you're better. That's why I said I think it was just an internet thing. Okay, so this cameo odic is just that's uh, yeah, yucky stuff, like right? Herb, or is that herbal? Like but you know, okay. Other tips so for for coming down quietly, coming down ears without right. suppressing. You know, right. things like yogurt in the ears can actually 
help restore the natural flora in the earth and natural bacteria in the earth and calm it down at the same time. Um, aloe vera, calendula, you know, we make up here in the office a mixture of concentrated aloe with calendula tincture. And we use that just to take the edge off. Uh, these things rarely, in my experience, rarely fix the problem or rarely get rid of the problem. You need to be prescribing for them at the same time. But I suspect, Christina, you asked me that because you can going uh, tell me what you use or what you would. Well, a lot, of the, a lot of the ones you talked about, you covered most of them, but you missed the two most important R&R ones, Reiki mm -hmm. and Rescue Remedy. So you can rescue remedy internally and topically. Uh, remember, just dilute it and uh, it's fine. It'll last a long time. And you can experiment with different concentrations to see what works the best. You can put a little bit of rescue remedy into the aloe and calendula. You can put rescue remedy into the olive oil or the green tea. And um, it depends on what the ear is doing, which you want to put in it. Or you don't want to put oily stuff on the skin that's going to get rubbed all over your furniture. But um, the flower essences, that won't happen to. Crab apple is good for skin conditions. It's a Bach flower. There are other flower essences from the different flower essence companies, spirit essences, green hope essences. And I've never had flower essences interfere with the homeopathic treatment. And then, of course, if you're offering Reiki every day, then you're going to be much less likely to have these problems get out of hand. And um, mentioning cutting the long hair off the dog's ears, particularly with poodles, makes me ask you a question, Jeff. Do you think it's important to pull hair from poodles' ears and all those dogs with a lot of hair in the ear? Should we be pulling them out the way women pull yeah, eyebrows? Yeah, I think we I should be shaving them into those nice cuts and dyeing them pink and purple. Um, well, I guess I'll answer <laughs> that question with the story of Jasper. Jasper was a poodle that came to me about six, seven years ago now. Never in all of his life had ear problems. And one day I went to a groomer that decided to pull all the hair out. Guess what that started? Beat, beat, beat red, ear inflamed infections. ears that did not want to quit. I mean, it was, um, it was, uh, it was a yep. difficult battle to, to treat the, the ear pump. Now, that being said, the ear problems with the underlying problem that cause the ear problems or cause the, the, um, the tenacious ear problems were probably there. We needed to address it one way or the other, but there's no question that the pulling out of the hair made the ears worse and trigger the ear problem. And yet a lot of dogs don't get bright red ears when hair is pulled and or when they use that. Back when I was a veterinary technician before the in the 60s and 70s, we used like a neat kind of product like you use for women's to do your legs with a chemical. And you'd spread that into the ear and then you'd flush the ear out and then you wouldn't have to pull. So we thought we were doing a really nice thing for the animals until we found out that it started irritating the skin you know, because it was a chemical. And that was back in, you know, my, my pre-holistic times. But I go, oh, well, but I didn't like to pull the hair. I did have a standard poodle, a black standard poodle, a fairly big one, actually, who had hair that was so thick that we had to go in with a pair of Metzenbaum scissors with the really blunt ends and cut the hair in the ear because he couldn't hear as well. There was just so much hair. So that's another approach if, if people need to do that, is they can trim the hair in the ears um, if it's really causing a problem. But um, if, if dogs genetically have hair in their ears, they ought to keep their hair in their ears. It's there for a reason, and it's not what causes the problem. Definitely when there's an ear infection that is making or an ear 
inflammation that's discharging and has goop all over the side of the face, you may need to cut or even shave the hair around the ear, or like I say, cut into. But I was just talking about this routine that everybody does with their dogs of pulling the hair in the ears in certain yeah. breeds. Yeah, there are, so, there are, there are two good. things I think that groomers do to the skin or skin, ears, and other organs that can be problematic. And one is, is with the ears, pulling the, ear, the hair out and telling people that there is an ear infection and there isn't. And the other thing, which seems innocuous, but can um, cover up a problem causing further bigger problems, is actually expressing anal sacs. A lot of groomers will routinely express anal sacs. Um, but again, just like the rest of the body, if they're not working properly. We need to know that and not palliate, not just cover up by, oh, well, we express them once a week and he's fine. Oh, oh yeah. poor things. So, yeah. Mm. Anything that has to be done regularly is a problem. I mean, I even assert, I, well, it's a challenge for me because our foods are so poorly raised these days, even organic ones, unless you've got just a really yummy farm that's been organic for years. But our soils are so nutrient de deficient that I think some animals and people do need to take vitamins and supplements because of that. Um, so somebody earlier asked about dry skin. Sometimes for something like dry skin, it may be that you need to add even a very healthy vital force may need some supplements. Um, it might need coconut oil or olive oil or a different food or because of how we live, how, you know, what we've done to poor Mother Earth here. Um, I, you know, I know that when we're completely healthy, we should be able to thrive on air, basically. But, you know, we're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> so any, um, any other tips? Poor skin or ears. Um, going on a fresher food diet. We're going to try to avoid, you know, rapid and harsh chemicals that get rid of the skin problems. Um, we're going to use sweet almond oil for soothing, aloe vera for soothing, green tea for cleaning. And you, uh, thank you for reminding me. And I think I'm going to start adding that to our, um, our aloe calendula mix. I'm going to start adding some rescue remedy to that as well. That's a great idea. Or muscle test to see if Green Hope Farms animal emergency essence or spirit essences, their emergency ones, see which one's best. There may be one that's better for your combination. Um, so just double check on that. And apple cider vinegar was mentioned in the chat that you and I didn't mention it. Apple cider vinegar I've seen often work to help dry out ears, but I've also seen some dogs react and get red ears if it's too strong um, or have it not work very well if it's too dilute. Um, so, but apple cider vinegar is wonderful for many, many, many different things. Um, even some, you know, bug repellent, putting it in their water, putting it in a separate bowl of water or putting a little bit in their food. I, I want to encourage people to never put anything in the drinking water. Don't put flower essences in the drinking water. Don't put apple cider vinegar in the drinking water. I want dogs and cats, even though cats, healthy cats don't drink much or if at all, I want water to be water. So if they need water, they can drink it. Whereas if you put something in it and they think health-wise they don't need that, they may be going thirsty. So I just, I want to always be sure there's fresh water in addition to treated water. Something that gets missed a lot with flower essence people. Um, oh, lavender, uh, lavender for lavender skin. There, we missed that. Spray, as whether it's spray, you know, we make a spray called Common Soothe, which, you know, has a bunch of essential oils that has, you know, lavender in it and not only will calm down itchy skin, but also helps soothe you know, the emotionally brought guardian as well as the animals. Um, but 
Well, here's another one. If, if you have an itchy dog, not if the skin is really raw, but um, the dogs who are itchy, some of that itchy is emotional. And so it can be emotional. Like you start itching and then you just keep going and going and get more frantic. Uh, so the Tellington Touch Anxiety Wrap with a um, with the um, Ace Bandage, I have found has really helped with a lot of itchy dogs. And doing T-Touch movements, learning the different ones for calming can help. And um, Healing Touch for Animals, again, just like Reiki, Healing Touch for Animals balances the chakras in that case and can clear up skin problems as well as... Um, uh, stop itching. So those are some others that are that can be useful. So you haven't found essential oils no. have hindered your homeopathy if people are it using that be, for the skin. Because a lot of people say they not, do. Not at all. Um, of course, we try to avoid exposing the, uh, the remedy to the essential oil, to the, any strong smell. And with, no matter what someone's doing, I usually ask them to no, not make any changes when we introduce the the a new homeopathic medicine, but you no, know, the the mild oils don't seem to to interfere. And again, I have to go back to the patients in the ICU and the other patients that are getting all kinds of strong drugs and other you know the horrible horrible things, some of which smell really bad, but homeopathy still works yeah. along with that. Right, right. Actually, that reminds me, I just happened to reread about it. Um, at our conference in Austin, we had a talk by a human homeopath who talked about four different countries where homeopaths worked right beside the doctors in the emergency rooms. And when people in an emergency room didn't respond to allopathic treatment with all the smells and everything you're talking about, Jeff, they then treated them homeopathically, and they recovered in some percentage of the cases. Yeah, and that, that was incredible. The book that I was meant that I was referring to is that homeopathy and emergency care in, in the ICU. Yeah. yeah, it's just hundreds of pages Maybe. of cases from all over the world. So, but two other tips before we have to run. Two other tips um, that we didn't cover. Whether mainly for itchy dogs and cats with dry skin, usually sometimes flaky skin, um, and that is grooming and brushing. And it's amazing to me how much daily brushing, which stimulates the the spacious glands and stimulates the skin to secrete the oil and make the hair more lustful. It's amazing how many itchy dogs stop itching just when you start brushing them every day. So good hygiene. And the other, um, mm -hmm. it might be not so much bathing, more brushing. Yeah, and yeah, and probably not bathing at all because that tends to dry out the skin. And actually, some some animals will get with worse and itch more just from getting wet. And of course, that's a great mm -hmm. homeopathic modality, something that we can convert into the language of homeopathy and actually use to help narrow down the choice of medicine that we give. Uh, the, other, the other thing I want to mention before we go is related to what you said about the uh, key touch and key touch wraps, and that is body suits. You know, the lycra body suits for these really itchy dogs or cats that either over groom or actually create sores by licking or scratching. Frequently, just the pressure of the lycra body suit will help bring down the itch. And of course, when they're wearing something like this, it's an artificial skin that they can't scratch and break their breakthrough as easily. I mean, certainly they can still do it. You know, I uh, key and I top coat, let me put that down. Key I is my favorite. They, they have beautiful, beautiful ones. Key and I top coat. 
Okay, to me, Jeff is getting cut off again and starting to freeze. <laughs> so um, I think it's time. Yeah, good. You typed it in. Very good. Canine top, top, top coat. Yep, I find all of those work really wonderfully. So any last words, Jeff? I can see if your words are back oh, yet. Oh, well, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear All you. All right. Um, any last words? Let's see. Just what we say week after week after week, and it's going to help the skin and allergies and ears more than anything else, and that is to live a, try to live a natural and clean lifestyle how to use the freshest and most vital food possible, try to get out in the sun. We didn't talk about the effect of the sun and the outside air and activity on skin and allergies, but you know that can certainly help many, many things improve, uh, along with including the skin and the ears. Um, and we didn't go into much detail about the direct connection in a lot of animals with itching and the emotions. You mentioned it a little while ago. But there are so many dogs that I've seen that itch when they're anxious or when there's something going on in the environment. And it's not the itch that needs to be treated, it's the anxiety. And again, it's the totality. Thing about homeopathy is it's treating both the anxiety and the itch at the same time. Reiki, treating the anxiety and the itch at the same time, just not as deeply, maybe. Okay, anything else that you want to mention, Christina? Any, you're going to be no, I mean, that's, the, the main thing is, is see any itching not as something that needs to be stopped, but as a clue that we need to treat the underlying energy imbalance. And the sooner we do it at the skin level, the longer and healthier they will last. So you're going to be teaching this weekend? Um, yep, it's or is, going is, to be, or it's going be an introduction to the holistic options for companion animal school that we're launching um, momentarily. Um, so it can be, well, there's there's quite a few people signed up. We'll see how many people show up, which is, yeah, yeah well Good. over 100 Excellent. people. And Excellent. actually we had a cap limit just in case all those people do show up. And right now, actually I was up till 3 in the morning last night uh, doing slides. And right now the trick is going to be to whittle it down because I want to be able to cover everyone's question like we do here and i don't know what needs to go and what needs to stay so that's what, that's what i'll be doing today. excellent well, good work it's a lot of hard work and it's well worth it jeff excellent that you got that and many people that's it's awesome really just as you said all about getting the word out and i hope that everyone here because so i know that both judy and and Debbie talked about hope everyone here is helping spread the word, um, get the viral, viral crowdsourced word out there about holistic care and homeopathic care, especially. Excellent. And I guess Excellent. we'll see you next week. Right. Yep, see you Thank next you week. All, All right. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.